Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of the let- Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by him. You were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day as we hear your word, and may we put your word into practice, now and always. Amen. This morning's scripture reading, it it is the lectionary text for the day, and I, I, I had a little bit of trouble connecting this to the first Sunday in Advent, so here we go. <laughs> the scripture reading today vo- focuses on on the beginning of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In this letter, Paul deals with issues that had arisen in this church community. Imagine that, issues that would come up in a church. Even with good intentions, there can be sensitive subjects that occur in a congregation. Now, I found online some of those actual mistakes that have been printed in church bulletins. You know, we've heard these over the years, but I found a couple of new ones. And see if any of these faux pas could lead to trouble in a church. The the National Prayer and Fasting Conference is coming up. The cost for attending the Fasting and Prayer Conference includes all your meals. (laughs) Miss Charlene Mason sang, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. (laughs) The peacemaking meeting schedule for today has been cancelled due to a conflict. (laughs) The sermon this morning is Jesus walks on the water. The sermon for this evening is searching for Jesus. (laughs) The rector will preach his farewell message after which the choir will sing break forth into joy. (laughs) Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our community. (laughs) Scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles, and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. (laughs) The church will be hosting an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. (laughs) Ladies' Bible study will be held Thursday morning. All ladies are invited to lunch in the fellowship hall after the BS is done. The eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. (laughs) And the low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7. Please use the back door. (laughs) Now that we know what problems are that exist in churches all over the country, let us now familiarize ourselves with Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Most of this historical reference about Corinth I found either from my daily Bible study series or from my life application Bible. If you were to look at a map of Corinth, you could tell just from the picture that this was a city that was made for great things. The southern part of Greece is very nearly an island, and on the west is the Corinthian Gulf, and on the east is the Saronic Gulf. And all that remains to join the two parts of Greece together is this little isthmus about four miles across. And on that piece of land was the city of Corinth. So all traffic from Athens and north of Greece to Sparta was routed through Corinth. It was also a treacherous at that time to travel by sea across the Cape of Malia, and quite often the ships needed to be taken out of the water, put on rollers, and carried across that isthmus. So Corinth was a busy place. It became quite the place of commerce. Lots of import, lots of export took place, export took place, and the city became a place of wealth and fine living. 
Now, because of this prosperity, Corinth also became known as a place where evil and wild and debauched activities took place. In other words, this was the Vegas of the Far East. Paul had spent time in Corinth and he had helped to establish a Christian presence. However, without being there every day, the Corinthian church had fallen into divisions and disorder. Instead of being one church in unity with Christ, factions and sects had arisen that had developed over who the best leaders were, who the best teachers were that were in and around the area. So in the first six chapters of this letter, Paul dealt with the division and the schisms that had arisen. And in chapter 7 and following, he lays out instructions for the Corinthian church to stay on the right path. Things about Christian marriage and Christian freedom and, and directions on how to establish public worship and things about the resurrection of Christ. But before he admonished, before he instructed, before he preached about the way of Jesus, he thanked God for the church in Corinth and for all those who belong to it. In these verses of our scripture reading today, Paul builds up the Corinthian Christians. He affirmed their privilege of belonging to God. He appreciated the power God had given them to understand and speak God's truth. And he encouraged and reminded them to use their spiritual gifts as they waited for Christ to be revealed. In these words of encouragement are great truths about our relationship with Jesus. And as we travel on that journey of faith, we arrive today at the first Sunday in Advent. Advent is a time of preparing for the coming of our Lord. And for the next few Sundays, we will light the Advent wreath to remind us of this time of hope and peace and joy and love. Advent is a time of waiting for the coming of Christ into the world. It is when we get our homes, we get our lives, and we get our hearts ready for Jesus. In Advent, we worship and remember God's love manifested in the birth of our Savior. And as we wait and prepare for the meaning of Christmas in our lives, let us note Paul's words today of when he thanks the people of Corinth. So I'm going to highlight the three things I talked about. First, Paul affirmed that it is a privilege to belong to God. Now, I know in our hearts that we all believe that. But I think we sometimes forget that what we do as Christians is a privilege for us to do so. From time to time, belonging to God, I think, can feel more like an obligation as there are expectations to being a Christian that we are supposed to do. People expect us, and we are expected, to pray, to study scripture, to attend worship every Sunday. We're expected to give of our time and our talents and our treasury. Sometimes belonging to God can be frustrating because we just don't get it right. We are constantly asking for forgiveness, making our confessions, seeking God's mercy, receiving God's grace, repeating the same sinful acts, and we are forever trying and failing to do better. Sometimes belonging to God can just be a drag. Other people to choose to do what they want, when they want it, and as many times as they want to do it. But we don't have that luxury because we have a calling to God and a command to do His work. Sometimes belonging to God can be hard. Our lives are not our own. God has to come first. We need to do what Jesus would do. And the kind of life that that creates, creates in us a sense of duty and responsibility and commitment. And although all of this is true, it doesn't change the fact that to belong to God is a privilege. Praying, studying scripture, attending worship, giving of our time and our talents, asking for forgiveness, making our confession, seeking God's grace, placing God first, doing what Jesus would do, and putting our faith into action. We should never ever see these things as what we have to do as Christians. We should always see these things as what we get to do because God loves us that much. 
Second thing we learn from Paul is to appreciate the power that God gave us to speak God's truth. What does that even mean, to speak God's truth? When we're out in the world speaking God's truth, what are we doing? Does that mean we are to read and memorize the Bible so that we can recall chapter and verse and apply it to everyday situations when it's warranted? Does it mean that we need to have that born again experience and share with others how we came to the Lord? Does it mean that we should be standing on street corners telling people to repent and sin no more? Is it necessary for us to build houses for Habitat for Humanity and work in homeless shelters and start crusades for God? When God is constantly in our thoughts, when Christ is in the center of our hearts, when the Holy Spirit moves us to action, we speak God's truth. When we pray for others, when we help someone in need, when we perform random acts of kindness to total strangers, we speak God's truth. When our faith guides our actions, when we can resist our temptations, when we can do the right thing, we speak God's truth. When the way we live our lives honors Christ, we speak God's truth. And finally today, Paul encouraged and reminded the Corinthians to use their spiritual gifts. In chapter 12 of Corinthians, Paul explains spiritual gifts. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to, teach, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another speaking in tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. That comes from the 12th chapter of Corinthians. Now, some scholars believe that our spiritual gifts are the things given to us by the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit is part of who we are, then everything God has bestowed on us comprises our spiritual gifts, our skills, our talents, our abilities, our personalities, our desire to do God's work. Our very lives are a gift from God. So Paul says, use that gift to serve God. Paul takes time in this letter to thank the people of Corinth for specific things that they had or that they were doing. Why are these particular things important? It's because when we see our faith as a privilege, when we can show others God's truth by the way we live, when we use our gifts to serve God, we show people God's love. We make a difference in someone's life. And our hearts are open to our Savior coming to us as a baby in a manger. Now, I read a story years ago. Uh, you'll know how long it was in just a second when I tell you the book. It was a book by Victor Hansen and Mark Canfield. And it was all the rage 25 years ago. It was called Chicken Soup for the Soul. And they put together all the collection of inspirational stories that they had heard. And I read when that first book came out, a story in there that I'm, I'm going to, uh, that I have, I use the word strongly, adapted from uh, to tell. I pulled it off an anti-bullying site so that, uh, from the internet so I could get it in for this sermon. So I, I have adapted and changed it. But I think the best way to tell this story, this story when you read it is told in the first person. You never know the person's name, but they're relating an experience in their life. And I think it just flows better if I do it that way. So I'm going to tell the story. Remember, it's, it's not my story. I stole, I borrowed it, I, I adapted it, I give credit to it. So I am repeating someone else's first person account. But the story goes like this. I remember meeting my friend Kyle when we were just freshmen in high school. 
I was coming home from school one day, and not very far from me, I saw across the grass this boy that I didn't know, and he had, was carrying all his textbooks in his hands, walking across the campus. And he was, as, he's, as he was ready to turn a corner, these three boys came from the other side and turned the corner and ran into him, pushed him down, pushed all his books, and started teasing and ridiculing him. I could see the sadness in his face, so I went over to help him. When I got there, the boys were gone, but I bent down and I, and I said, I haven't seen you before, and it looks like you have a lot to carry. So I helped him. I picked up the books, and he said thank you, and he said his name was Kyle, and he seemed like a nice kid. I asked him where he lived, and he told me that where he lived, and I said, you know, that's just a block away. That's just around the corner from my house. Why don't we walk a little bit? So I took half his books, and we walked and we talked and I got to know this person and he seemed like a really nice kid. When we got to his house, I said, you know, tomorrow some of my friends and I are playing football. Why don't you join us? And he said that he would like to do that. He had just transferred from a private school and he was having a hard time making friends and a hard time not being picked on. And he thought it would be good to meet some new people. So he showed up the next morning, we played football, and I spent all weekend with this person who was quickly becoming my friend. He was bright, he was funny, he was popular. I thought so, and as the years passed, my friends thought so, and for the next four years during high school, we became the best of friends. Inseparable, doing everything together, and just having a great time. And now it was senior year, we were getting ready to go off to college. I was going to one college uh, to study business and going there on a college football scholarship. And he was going to another college to study to be a, a doctor, going on an academic scholarship because this bright popular kid was also the valedictorian of our class. I knew that we would be friends for life even though we were about to go our separate ways. So graduation day came, we were in the big auditorium. I told him, I asked him if he was nervous about his speech. He said, of course I am. We laughed about that. I went to take my seat and the high school graduation festivities began just like they do in every high school. And it got time for the valedictorian speech and he made the speech just like he does, just like you've heard a hundred times I mean, I don't know about you, and, and this is me talking now. I've been to a thousand of these things um, in youth ministry, and the valedictorian speeches are all the same. But as this man relates in his story, this one was different. It started out the same. It thanked the parents, and it thanked the teachers, and it thanked the opportunities, and it, 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 it hit on and highlighted how we're going to change the world and make a difference and do all the things you're going to do in life, and this school has given us the tools to do this, and we move forward. But then his valedictorian speech got very different. It got very personal. And he told a personal story in his life to where he showed the vulnerability to the audience. He told the story of the day that we met. Only the events were different in my mind than in his. He still dropped his books. He still was being bullied. He still was trying to make it in the world. But he told everybody that life was too hard for him that day and he was in a new school and he was getting picked on and he wasn't yet learning how to do all the good grades and what he wanted to do and he had no friends and he couldn't take it anymore and he took all his books with him that day because he didn't want his parents to clean out his locker after he took his life but everything changed when he met that friend and they became best friends from that day forward and the story ends with him saying that we both made a difference in each other's lives, but I never realized the death until that moment in time. We need to remember that the way we live our lives, we are making a difference every day for God in this world. So when we live, we need to remember that it is a privilege for us to do what we do for God. It's a privilege every single day because we get to speak God's truth. We get to show people by our actions what God is like. We get to show people by our actions how we can bring others to God. And we do that by using the gifts that Christ gives us to go out and just be who we are 
and make a difference in this world. We need to believe that what we do, the way we live our lives, the simple, ordinary tasks that we do every day for and with God, we need to believe that they are making a difference to someone's life in this world because they are. And when we understand that, then we have joy and hope and peace and love in our hearts as we prepare for that little baby coming to us on Christmas Day and coming to our hearts every day of our lives. So let us pray. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for what you give us, for you seeing the importance of our lives to others in this world. Help us to feel that privilege and to live that every day, now and always. Amen.